Alrighty. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Caitlin Joseph, and I am an intern at CLCV, and I will be moderating today's session. So thank you so much for joining. And today's session is entitled Unlocking Your Power, Embracing Help with Decisions for a Better Future. And our presenter today is Dana Tram, um, JD, MSW, and Senior Staff Attorney at Disability Law Center in Virginia. Um, before we get started, there's a few housekeeping rules that we'd like to address. Speakers, please remember that we are using live captioning and interpreting services. Um, when you first introduce yourself today, whether it be as a speaker or as a participant later on, please include a physical description of yourself and your preferred pronouns, such as, I'm a white woman with straight brown hair and glasses. I'm wearing a teal floral blouse and have the DLCV Summit blue background. My preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, this will help provide some context for the attendees who might be blind or vision impaired and will also help our interpreters and captioners locate who is speaking on the screen. Um, please stay muted at all times unless you are the speaker. And we do have a chat box that will be used throughout the session and moderated by myself. Um, so please feel free to ask questions as they pop up throughout the session and we will pause and answer them as they come up. All right, and so I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, Dana. Thank you so much for being here today. Sure. So my name is Dana Trainum, and I am a senior staff attorney at the Disability Law Center of Virginia. I am a middle-aged, overweight, white woman with medium-length brown hair, and I wear glasses. My background is blurred. Um, so if for anybody who feels comfortable turning their cameras on, it would be great. Um, otherwise, I feel like I'm speaking to a void. Um, I love doing this in person so I can actually see people and we can be interactive. I do want this to be an interactive presentation. Um, I asked Caitlin, our moderator, um, to take out the part about leaving questions till the end, because I feel like if you have a question, um, it's best to go ahead and get it answered while we're talking about that topic. So. If, um, if you have a question, if you feel comfortable unmuting yourself and asking that question, please do so. If not, you can put it in the chat box and Caitlin will let me know that we have a question. Um, so we're gonna start out with the test. Did you all, did, did um, anybody let you know that we're having a test? Yep. Uh, did anybody know that? Um, all right, well, it's only two questions. So um, hopefully you'll know the answers without studying. Excuse me. The first question is, and I sure hope somebody um, unmutes themselves and answers. Um, who is the best person to make decisions about your health care? Okay, so Nelson says myself. Okay, good. Oh, you got 100% so far. What if for some reason I'm not able to communicate my decisions or even make my decisions? Maybe I have um, have an injury or an illness and I am no longer capable of making my own decisions or communicating my own decisions. Then who is the best person to make decisions about my medical care? Or even my life in general? Anybody? POA. Susan, can you tell us what a POA is? Put you on the spot. Okay, all right. In your case, your wife of 18 years, right. So um, a POA or a power of attorney um, is a document that I can use that, um, can name somebody to speak for me when I can't. So I think the correct answer or maybe um, a correct answer to the question of if I can't make my own decisions or I can't communicate my own decisions, who's the best person to make decisions is still me. I think the answer is the same for both questions. The way I get to that is doing what Susan said. I do think I, I put things in place now for that time in the future when I may not be able to make decisions for myself. And I can do that by either doing a power of attorney or a POA, um, like Susan mentioned, and that allows me to name somebody that I trust 
somebody who is going to be my voice and make decisions as I would make them. Another way I can do that is to put my, my, um, my uh, preferences and my healthcare choices in writing ahead of time in an advanced directive document. So um, let me talk a little bit about vocabulary so that we're all on the same page as far as, far as that goes. So I've already used some terms, advanced directive, power of attorney. Let's actually define those terms. I see the term advanced directive as being the general umbrella term. Um, and under advanced directives, there are parts and pieces and it's a la carte. You can choose what parts and pieces work for you and leave out which parts and pieces don't work. Um, so under the advanced directive umbrella, there is the power of attorney. Um, we've already talked about that. That's when I name somebody to make decisions for me in any situation where I've been deemed unable to do so for myself. Also under the umbrella of advanced directives, um, oh, and let me go back to a power of attorney. I could do it for healthcare. I could do it for financial decisions. Um, and I can also do it for educational decisions for children who are in the school system, K through 12, um, who have an IEP um, or in special education. Can somebody let someone in from the waiting room, please? Um, so advanced directive umbrella, I have power of attorney. I can also have what's called a medical directive. And that's where I put my wishes, my preferences, um, and my desires in writing ahead of time. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later, about all the different things you can put into a medical directive. I can also put in writing how I feel about things such as organ donation, um, how I, um, I could even put in there um, uh, my preferences for after I die, um, cremation, burial, um, I can get very specific about that or keep it very general. Um, I can also put in there what's called a living will. And a living will allows me to say how I'd want to be treated when I'm at the end of my life. When death is imminent, um, there is no cure for what's going on. Death is imminent. Um, do I want to be kept alive um, with artificial hydration, nutrition, um, um, you know, by a feeding tube, uh, artificial respiration with a respirator, um, or do I want to be kept comfortable and um, allow my body to die um, naturally without the artificial um, uh, prolonging of life? That's called the living will. All of those things can be part of an advanced directive. So let's talk a little bit more about the two parts of that that I see used most often um, in, the, in the disability area. Um, and that is power of attorney, like we've talked about, and the medical directive. And these are things that are um, very important for all of us because this is uh, something that pertains to all of us. Any of us at any time can have something happen to us where we are unable to make our own decisions or communicate our own decisions. And if nothing is in writing, then things can get pretty hairy about who's gonna make decisions um, on, on my behalf. So with the power of attorney, I choose who can make decisions for me. When I'm looking at who um, I wanna choose to do that, I know Susan said, um, her wife, she picked um, to do that. And, and I would say that's the most common is the person's spouse. Um, a lot of times people will choose their children or their best friend, or here's the thing. It can be anybody that you trust, anybody that you know will be your voice and make decisions as you would make them, even if they don't agree with them. That's the tough part. Um, I have had people that want to do an advanced directive and um, they really want to name like their spouse or their child, but they don't think that they, you know, if push came to shove that they would be able to follow their wishes, especially when it comes to end of life. Um, and so they may not choose that person who is the closest to them. Um, I know that uh, my mom has an advanced directive right now that names me. Um, as her agent, and we're, that's another vocabulary word we're going to get to, um, 
to make decisions for her in a power of attorney, but she's thinking that maybe that's not such a great idea um, because um, it would put me in a situation of maybe having to go against my brothers or other family members to make decisions. And she would like me just to be with her um, at a time when she's in crisis and not able to make her own decisions um, and, and maybe not put me in the position of having to make those tough decisions. So there's a lot to think about when you're choosing your agent in a power of attorney. Um, so a back to vocabulary word on the agent. Uh, some people will say, uh, Sarah is my power of attorney. And we all know what that means. Um, but the technical way of saying it is Sarah is my agent in my power of attorney. Um, so be sure to uh, correct your friends at the next dinner party because that'll make you really popular. Um, Technically, power of attorney is the document, and the person you choose to make decisions for you is your agent in your power of attorney. So um, another vocabulary word that I want to cover is capacity. Um, and I've been talking too long already. I'm getting tired of my own voice. Can anybody tell me what, it, what capacity means when we're talking about, um, I don't mean capacity to fit in a room or you know, capacity of 318. Um, what does it mean, mental capacity, when we're talking about decision making? Anybody want to step forward? Quiet group today. Wow. Okay. So the um, the definition that I, the ability to make decisions, thanks, Susan. How much are we able to handle? Yes, yes, very good, very good responses. Um, I really like the fact that you didn't say the ability to make good decisions or the ability to make uh, the ability to make decisions on behalf of someone else. Yes. Um, the best definition that I have seen that I think really captures what we're looking at is. In order to have capacity, I need to be able to do three things. I need to be able to take in information that's given to me. And that's however I take it in. Uh, I speak English, so the doctor should give it to me in English. If he gives it to me in Spanish, it doesn't mean I lack capacity because I don't understand him. It's that the doctor has not given it to me, given the information to me in a way that I can understand it. So when I'm looking at, um, you know, working with or advocating for people with disabilities, they may have a different um, communication style. Uh, we have an ASL interpreter here who has her camera on. Thank you. Um, and um, so if someone needs an ASL interpreter to be able to take in the information in a way that they understand it, then that needs to be provided. Some folks um, may have limited cognitive ability and they may need the doctor to explain things in plain English, not those big words that they learn in medical school. And it may be the advocate's job, the parent or whoever is there advocating for the person, for the doctor to explain it in a way that the person can take in that information. Okay, so the first thing to have capacity is to take in information. The second is to be able to make a decision based on that information. A decision. No adjective there, not good decision, not rational decision, not the best decision, but the ability to make a decision. And then the third thing is be able to communicate that decision. And much like the first um, um, component of it, however they communicate it. So they may communicate it in another language. They may communicate it through an interpreter. They may communicate through gestures. Um, they may use assistive technology. However it is they communicate that decision because there are certainly folks, had a lot of clients who didn't communicate verbally, um, but they absolutely had capacity and they were able to communicate. It's just the person receiving the information for them had to understand how they communicated. If a person can do those three things, they have capacity. In Virginia, um, and, and probably in other states, but we're talking about Virginia um, law in this case, in this um, session. In, capacity is important for a couple of different reasons. Number one, 
you have to have capacity in order to do the things we're talking about, advanced directive and all those parts and components, including a power of attorney. You have to have capacity. You have to understand that document. Maybe not every word because a lot of it is legalese, but you have to understand generally that you are giving somebody else the right to make decisions for you if you can't. Um, you know, a very a, a general understanding of what rights you're giving somebody else on your behalf. Capacity is also important because when you're doing a power of attorney for healthcare, um, it's what's called a springing power of attorney. Again, this is gonna make you so popular at your next, next dinner party coming up with these terms. A springing power of attorney means that it has no effect when the person signs it. So when I sign my power of attorney, giving Caitlin the right to make decisions for me, Caitlin has no authority at that point. She only gets the authority when I lose capacity, when I am no longer able to make my own decisions. So it, my, her authority springs into effect when I lose capacity, okay? Um, how do I lose capacity? Um, under Virginia law, um, in order to lose capacity for a power of attorney to kick in, um, for Caitlin to get that authority, is that two doctors have to determine that I don't understand a decision that needs to be made. Um, one of those, how it usually happens is my doctor, my attending doctor, um, my regular doctor um, who is treating me, talks to me about a decision that needs to be made. He or she doesn't think that I understand understand it. So they bring in another doctor who is not treating me. Uh, and that doctor evaluates me to decide whether I have capacity or not. If both of those doctors agree that I don't understand and I need somebody else to make that decision, I am not capable of making the decision, then that's when the power of attorney kicks in. That's when they turn to Caitlin and ask her to make the decision for me. If I have given her that authority, in my power of attorney. Um, there is another way to lose capacity in Virginia. Anybody have any, any ideas what that is? Anybody know? Through the guardianship process. So that's a court process. So through a guardianship process, um, Caitlin decides that um, I, uh, I'm not able to handle my own affairs. I'm not able to make my own decisions um, regarding healthcare or where I live or any of my decisions about my daily life. So she files a petition with the court um, along with uh, a medical evaluation that says, um, I am not capable of handling my own affairs or taking care of my day-to-day uh, -day decisions. And um, through a court process, which we're not going to delve into today, it goes beyond what we're talking about. But through a court process, the judge decide, has to decide two things. Number one, um, do I have capacity? Is it true that what Caitlin says and what maybe her medical report says, that I truly do not have the ability anymore to make my own decisions about my life? And if I don't, then who is the best person? to be my guardian. Is it Caitlin? She's the one who filed the petition. Um, if Caitlin is not appropriate, according to the court, then the court will look other, to other um, possibilities. But at that point, um, the, the court will appoint me a guardian. Um, at DLCV, we talk to people about avoiding guardianship and talking about alternatives to guardianship. The reason we do that is because a lot of civil rights are lost uh, when someone is appointed a guardian. Um, I think you guys have access to the handouts, but in the handouts it lists several of those um, civil rights that are lost. Um, some of the big ones are the right to vote, um, the right to decide where I live, all my medical care, um, including mental health care, and um, the right to sign a contract. Just think of it. Anytime you sign your name to something, you are legally able to do that because you have capacity. If a court decides I don't have capacity, then signing my name to a document has no effect. Um, I can't get married or divorced. Uh, I can't write a will. 
Um, so I can't um, possess a firearm, I can't drive. So the list goes on and on of the civil rights that are lost for a person who has a guardian appointed. Um, the way we avoid guardianship is doing some of the things that we've already talked about, doing an advanced directive, um, maybe including a power of attorney document. Um, another thing that another uh, alternative um, or a model is supported decision making. And we in the disability world are hearing a lot about supported decision making um, as if it's a new thing. Uh, it's not. Um, let me ask you guys this. Um, what, last time you had to make a major decision in your life, get married, get divorced, change jobs, move to another city, maybe a, a major medical um, diagnosis and you have to decide on treatment. What are some of the steps that you took um, in order to make that decision? Um, if anybody wants to speak, please do so. All right, well, I'll tell you some of the steps I take. Um, I uh, Making a pro and con list, um, thinking of the impact on my decision, yes, doing a pros and cons. Um, I talked to my mom um, about the decision or other people who were important to me. I Google it, which sometimes um, can lead you down uh, a scary road, especially if it's a medical uh, situation. Uh, I talked to my coworkers. I talked to friends, maybe from church or book club, or all of all of that is everybody I've mentioned. Those are my natural supports. That's my natural support system. They're just they're not hired. They're not paid. They're not you know they are just who's in my life um, who provides me support, and I turn to them to help me make these major decisions. Ultimately, it's my decision, and. Terry and Susan and Sarah and Nelson might all tell me to do A, and I may ultimately decide to do B. Um, they may be able to say, I told you so later, but ultimately the decision is mine, even if all my supporters don't agree with it. Um, the reason this seems new to the disability community is because um, we are now seeing this as a, as a good alternative to guardianship. And so some of the people that I work with, I'd say a lot of the people that I work with um, with disabilities don't have that natural support system. They may not have ever been able to work. So they don't have the coworkers or maybe they don't have um, a church fellowship or a book club, or they didn't get involved in any sort of um, community activities. And a lot of folks, don't um, experience the world in the same way that, that, that some of us do. So in, that, in those situations, we may have to set up an artificial support system in order for um, that to, for supported decision-making to work. So I'm gonna use my daughter as an example. She's only five, but let's pretend she's 18 or almost 18. And I might um, talk to my friends or, um, family members, and I might say, Terry, I, you are really good at researching. Um, I know, man, you are good at finding things, research articles, all kinds of information. Um, if Elena needs help making a major decision, can she turn to you and ask you to do some of that research that she's not able to do? Great. Susan, you are really good at bringing things down so that Elena can understand it taking that information that Terry finds on the internet and really bringing it down to Elena's level to understand it. Would you be willing to do that for her? And Sarah, Elena trusts you and she's comfortable talking to you. So when she has all this information, can she come to you and just, you'd be willing to listen and kind of help her talk through it. And Nelson, I know you are great at like financial things so, um, you know, if Elena has some financial decisions to make or there's a financial aspect to a decision, can she kind of talk that through with, with you and you can kind of guide her? So I'm setting up what I have naturally, what you guys probably have naturally in an artificial way, 
with the hopes that eventually it, it will become um, a natural support system for Elena as she gets to, to work with um, these folks on, um, you know, throughout her life and making a decision. And you'll notice that I didn't give myself a job um, because I already have one. I'm her mom. Um, and a, a lot of times it helps to get another perspective. She's going to have my perspective because I can't keep my nose out of her business. And that's going to be true her entire life. So um, she's already got me. I'm trying to put other people in place that will, will support her, wrap around her and give her the support she needs. And it also helps parents, family members um, feel a little less scared of what happens when I'm no longer here because there, there are other people that Elena can turn to, other people that will support her. So that's supported decision-making. And it can be that informal, um, you know, or it can be formal. There are um, supported decision-making agreements. Um, and um, I'll get to your question, Caitlin. Um, there, you can do an agreement, you can do it in writing. Um, there are, um, and I'm not sure if I put it in the presentation, but if not, um, I'll be more than happy to email you guys. Um, there is a website for Virginia that talks about supported decision-making agreements, and it gives you great information as well as some samples. So um, the supported decision-making agreement, just like an advanced directive, any part of an advanced directive, including a power of attorney can absolutely change if the situation in my life changes. So say, you know, um, let's go back to the power of attorney, true for supported decision-making too, but um, in my power of attorney, I need, I need Caitlin to make decisions for me when I can't. Well, Caitlin done gone and do some, done something and really pissed me off. And so Caitlin and I don't talk anymore. Sorry, Caitlin. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to want to rewrite my power of attorney because if I don't rewrite it, um, and something happens to me, then Caitlin's still making decisions for me. So I'm going to want to rewrite that pretty quickly to name somebody other than Caitlin. I'm also going to want to look at it just periodically because things change. My power of attorney document still has my dad listed as one of my agents. Um, and he died in 2018. So, you know, I need to do, I need to practice what I preach. Um, I, I have three other agents named in there, um, but my dad is still in there. Um, and, and he's been gone for five years almost. So um, speaking of multiple agents um, in a power of attorney document, say Caitlin and I, when we were talking to each other, spent a lot of time together. And so what if I named Caitlin to be the person to speak for me and we're in a car accident together and neither one of us are conscious, neither one of us can make decisions. Or a less morbid thing, what if Caitlin goes on a cruise, and that's why I'm so pissed at her because she didn't invite me. Um, what if she goes on a cruise and she's not available to make decisions for me and something happens while she's gone? I want to name an alternate agent. So I'm gonna name Terry. I'm gonna, you know, if Caitlin's not available, um, then Terry, I want you to make decisions for me. And I can have as many, you know, as I want down the line. Like I said, I have four. Um, you know, my wife is first, my, my best friend is second, my mom is third, my dad is fourth. Um, the thing that I want to stress when you're talking about more than one agent, there's a couple of ways to do it. I could say I want Caitlin and Terry to make decisions for me when I can't. Does anybody see a problem with that or a potential problem with that? Anybody? Compromise can be hard. Decisions not being made because of disagreement, right? Right, both of that. So um, by naming two agents who have the power, a conflict, right? By naming two agents with the power at the same time, I created a problem I was trying to avoid, right? So now there's nobody to make decisions for me because they don't agree. So what I recommend is not doing it that way, but doing it as successive agents. So if Caitlin can't do, I you want know, Caitlin first. If she can't do it, then Terry. If Terry's not available, then Susan. Um, so that I always have those backups. All right. Any questions at this point? I love questions. No? All right. 
Um, I'm oh, sorry, Terry just moved on my screen. It's always disconcerting when somebody moves on a screen. There's Terry, hi. Um, so let's talk about medical directives. Remember, that's one of the things under the umbrella of an advanced directive. Uh, in a medical directive, I can put in writing uh, things about my healthcare that are important to me. So I can put in writing uh, doctors that I want to treat me and don't want to treat me, uh, hospitals that I would prefer to go to and hospitals that I don't want to go to, uh, medications that I agree to take or uh, medications that I give a refusal now for the future, any types of treatment that I either would uh, consent to or not consent to. Uh, if I'm in a crisis situation, I can say what helps. Um, so if I'm in a crisis situation, um, you know, and you know, I'm gonna hurt myself or somebody else, uh, what helps me calm down? Pretty much anything that you can think of. Virginia doesn't have a magic form. Uh, DLCV does have um, forms on its webpage, Supported Decision-Making Resource page. Um, we have do-it-yourself forms with line-by-line -line instructions. Uh, I think they're fabulous because I wrote them. Um, but there is no magic form. It can be, it's, it's, can be done in any way that suits you and your situation and your family. So uh, it can be as general as you want it to be or as specific as you want it to be. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing a medical directive is all those things I named that you can put in there, most of those are preferences. So if I say, I only wanna to go to, I live in the in Gordonsville, which is like Charlottesville area is my hospital. Um, I could say, I only wanna to go to Martha Jefferson. I do not wanna to go to the University of Virginia. Um, but situation may happen where I may um, need to go to University of Virginia. I'll give you an example. Uh, many years ago, I was um, working on a construction project at my house, um, was not well thought out, was not a good decision. Um, and I cut one of my fingers off with a power saw. Now, my advanced directive says I don't want to go to University of Virginia, but guess what? University of Virginia is the level one trauma center, and they are the ones that have the uh, micro uh, uh, plastic surgery department that could reattach my finger and it is reattached. Um, so even though I had a preference to go to Martha Jefferson, um, I went to UVA because they had the services that I needed. This often comes into play also when you're looking at psychiatric care. Someone may say, I wanna to go to this hospital, not that hospital for psychiatric care. But when it comes down to it, if the person is committed, um, it becomes a matter of who has a bed at that point. Um, and so you can put your preferences in writing, but they may or may not be followed. When it comes to medication, that will be followed. So if I say I do not consent to medication A, um, that is the same as if I tell my doctor no in person at the time. That is a refusal to give consent. And that will be followed, except. There's always an except, right, in the law, um, except in situations where it's an emergency situation and the doctor determines that's the only medication for that emergency. I can't even imagine a situation where that would come up because there are, doctors have so many options for medications, but that is an exception in the law. When I talk about... Um, treatments I want or don't want, um, or things that help if I'm in a crisis situation, those will, should be followed by the doctor um, if, it, if it is in standard medical practice. So let me give you some examples. Um, when I'm really, uh, man, when I'm in a crisis situation, the only thing that calms me down, man, is holding my rattlesnake. I mean, I just, I, you know, that, okay, no doctor is gonna be required to allow my rattlesnake I don't own one, just so you know. Um, it's illegal to own a rattlesnake. Um, so, you know, no doctor is going to be required to do that. Or 
when I'm when I'm really upset, the only thing that calms me down is um, oh, massage by Sven. Um, you know, no hospital is going to re be required to hire Sven to come and give me um, a massage. But here's the thing: I can still put those things in my medical directive because and and I used to like put that in there, and then um, an occupational therapist called me on it one time. She goes. I think they should put those things in there anyway, because as an occupational therapist, I can look at those things and say, okay, we can't let you have your rattlesnake in the hospital, but we do have dogs and cats and other animals that are therapy animals that come in. Can we sign you up for that? Would that help you? Or the massage, you know, um, no, I, as an occupational therapist or a physical therapist, I can't give you a massage or call Sven, but I may be able to talk to you about ways that you can soothe yourself using those techniques. So it's okay to put any of that stuff in your um, medical directive. I say, throw it all in there because here's the thing. The, the thing that a medical directive does is it talks to your doctor when you're not able to. So imagine being in another city and you have some sort of crisis and you go to an emergency room. Nobody there knows you. Nobody knows your medical care. Imagine this doctor, I mean, this document speaking for you, telling your doctors and your medical professionals what is important to you, what you want, what you don't want. Um, how do I make these things legal? Well, the only thing that is required in Virginia is um, that they be signed in the presence of two witnesses and that I sign it and my two witnesses sign it. And we're all in the room at the same time. Um, I say that I, as clearly as I can because um, I have gotten documents back that people let me look at and um, the witnesses signed on different dates. That advance directive um, is not valid because I have to sign it in the presence of two witnesses and those witnesses have to sign. The document does not have to be notarized in Virginia. I do recommend it if at all possible. Um, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, let's face it, documents look more legit with that seal on it. They just do. Um, it doesn't change the legality of the document in Virginia because it's not required, um, but it does make it look more legit and may be questioned less. Um, and sometimes uh, time is of the essence. And so you want it just to be recognized so that you can get the care that you need as quickly as possible. Um, another reason is traveling across state lines. Uh, any state will honor a Virginia medical directive, advanced directive, any part of it, um, as long as it was legally valid in Virginia. But if I go to a state that requires it to be notarized and the registration people are looking at it and it's not notarized, it's going to take time for them to figure out whether it's legal in the state where I signed it. So just get it notarized if you can. Once I have done all of this, all, all this work, um, I've signed it, I, you know, maybe I've gotten it notarized. Uh, I want to just uh, put it in the family Bible and put it in a safe deposit box and forget about it, correct? Is that right? I see a shaking, I see a couple of shaking heads. Anybody have any idea why that's a bad idea? You need to have it with you in your person. Yes, I need to either have it with me or I need to have uh, a card that says I have an advance directive and how to get in touch with my um, my agent or how to get a hold of my advance directive. Uh, fortunately, Virginia has um, a free service of um, where you can um, upload your document and it's on a database and then you carry a card with you that says you have one on the Virginia database for that, um, the advanced directive registry and, and anybody, I mean, the, anybody from the rescue squad all the way up to the hospital can get access to that. Um, you can have photos on your phone. Yes, if you haven't uploaded it. Speaking of phone, um, some, uh, I think probably all of us are tied to one of these things. Um, who has ice in their phone? Okay. I'm not asking you to put your phone in ice. I'm asking you to put ice in your phone. It's very different, very different. 
ICE in your phone is in case of emergency. So capital I, capital C, capital E in case of emergency. There are apps for it. Um, the other thing is when, um, so when Caitlin and, and Terry are my agents and a power of attorney in my phone, I would put ICE, Caitlin Joseph, ICE, Terry Lynn Smith. So um, one way that they find um, who to make decisions, like if I'm unconscious, they'll look in my phone and look for ICE. Um, and there are apps where you can actually upload your entire document, as well as medical history and all kinds of medical stuff that um, the doctors may need to know. The good thing about um, ICE uh, apps is that a lot of times you set the you can set it so that people can open it without unlocking your phone because obviously if you're unconscious you're not going to be able to unlock your phone um, but they can still get to your ice information so uh the reason it's not a good idea to just put it in your safe deposit box is when does your family get access to your safe deposit box after you are dead so you don't want your family like getting it after your dad and like, oh, wow, she did want life support. Uh, wow, because um, that's too late, right? Um, this cannot be a secret document. This document has to be shared, has to be shared with family members that need to know um, with all of your doctors. Uh, I remember when I first started doing this presentation, somebody said, uh, Oh, come on, even my dentist? I'm like, how many of you have almost had a heart attack at the dentist office? I mean, you know, come on. Um, plus the dentist sometimes uses anesthesia. I mean, anything could happen, right? I could be at my podiatrist and have a medical emergency. So yes, um, all of your medical professionals should have it. Um, any other person in your life, um, if you have a, a spiritual uh, person, your pastor or priest, um, someone like that, um, folks who have uh, case managers, uh, if they're still in school, um, just anybody who might be in a situation of being with you when an emergency happens, um, you want to give copies to that person or that organization. The other thing is, is that you can register your advance directive with your area hospitals. You don't have to be a patient right then to do that. Um, you can go to the hospital and say that you'd like to register your advanced directive. Um, and I do know that if you would register at one Centera, it's gonna be registered at all the Centeras. So um, I know we have, you guys have a lot of hospitals in the Richmond area. So um, that may seem um, a little much, but a lot of them are owned by, by certain corporations. So, um, when I'm sending out all of these copies, you know, you get a copy and you get a copy and you get a copy. I need to keep track of who's getting those copies because if I ever want to change it, when Caitlin, you know, I kick her to the curb and um, I want to change my advanced directive, I need to let folks know who are relying on that advanced directive that it's no longer valid. And now Terry's my BFF. And so she's the person that they're going to go to. Okay. Um, Questions, things I didn't cover that you guys thought I would. Well, you covered this, but um, are you able to put in the chat or tell us again uh, where we can upload an advanced directive so that everybody can have access to it? Sure. Can one of you look up the um, webpage for um, DLCV to supported decision making? It's there. Okay. And put it in the, find it? In the chat. Yeah. Okay. And um, can you also look up DBHDS supported decision making and put that in the chat as well, please? All right, tell me the second one again. DBHDS supported decision making. Okay, so someone's at, Susan's asking a question about a will. Um, I took wills and trusts in law school. The only thing I learned is that I never, ever want to do anything dealing with anybody's will. So I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, when it comes to wills, man, it is 
literally we learn that a period in the wrong place or a comma in the wrong, I mean, can make, can make a difference. So um, it's just not something that I know that much about. Um, whether to consult an attorney or not for a will, probably. Um, but again, um, I'm just speaking as a person now, not a lawyer. Um, not that lawyers aren't people, that didn't come out right. Um, but anyway, um, I finished earlier than I thought. This is usually a two hour presentation and I thought I gotta get it down to an hour. And, um, and I think I did too good a job on that. So there's gotta be some questions. Um, I have a question. So how do you recommend introducing this type of conversations, maybe family members or um, just other individuals in your life who might not know about this? Or it might be kind of a scary or awkward topic to talk about for the first time. Yeah. Well, right now you're in a really good place because you can honestly say, that I went to the presentation by this old woman and she was talking about this topic. And I think this is something that I really want to do, or this is something I really want to talk about. Um, look, this is not a topic that's fun to talk about because who wants to talk about when they're incapacitated or who wants to talk about when they're um, you know, at the end of life and they're talking about life-sustaining treatment. This is not a fun conversation to have, but I will tell you that I have seen families torn apart um, by these issues because the person did not put their wishes in writing and they did not name anybody to make decisions for them. Um, so um, that's one thing I didn't cover. What if you don't do this? But I wanna, before I get to what if you don't do this, I think it was Susan asked the question the difference between a power of attorney and a durable power of attorney. Um, there really is no difference. Um, a power of attorney for medical care is um, always durable, meaning that it stays in effect even if I lose capacity. Obviously, that's true because you know my agent doesn't even get authority until I lose capacity. It comes into play more in a financial power of attorney. So I may say that Caitlin can handle my financial affairs for me, and. Um, Financial powers of attorney usually don't, are not springing. Usually as soon as I sign a financial power of attorney, Caitlin would have the authority um, to handle my financial affairs. But I may put in there, I want Caitlin to handle my financial affairs only if I have capacity. So that is not durable. The reason I may wanna do that is I trust Caitlin, but only to a certain extent. Um, I want her to be able to handle my affairs because it's convenient for me, but I don't trust her if I'm not able to watch what she's doing. So that's how it comes into play in financial powers of attorney, um, but it doesn't come into play for medical powers of attorney. Um, does, that, that, does that answer your question, Susan? Does that? No. <laughs> okay, okay then I need to know a little bit more about um, what I didn't answer. And then, then we're gonna talk about what if I haven't done any of these things. Um, about, is there a separate document for each or just the wording? So a separate document, I do recommend separate documents for medical and financial powers of attorney. There are folks that will use what's called a general power of attorney where they try to put them both in there. Um, I don't recommend it for a couple of reasons. First off, I may choose different people to make my medical decisions than my financial decisions um, because those are two very different types of decisions. I may trust Caitlin to make my medical decisions, but I don't want her anywhere near my money. So I may choose Terry to handle my money and Caitlin to make my medical decisions. And that gets, that's just gets too confusing if you try to put it together in the same document. The other reason is um, my doctor doesn't need to know my financial stuff and my bank doesn't need to know my medical stuff. So I think it's better to just keep them separate. Um, so let me know if, if that answers your question. Yay, okay. 
Um, so what if I haven't convinced you um, and uh, you don't do any of the advanced planning that we've talked about today? Um, and I will say that I, I don't know the recent statistics, but years ago it was 85% of Americans do not do this. Um, so only a very small 15% of Americans actually do what we're talking about doing. Um, in Virginia, we have a law called the Healthcare Decisions Act, and that sets up a way for um, someone to make decisions for me when I'm not able to do so for myself and I have not done advanced planning. And it gives a hierarchy of people who can make decisions for me if I'm not able to, and I haven't named anybody. The first on that list is my spouse, um, and that is my legal spouse. Virginia does not have common law marriage, so I may have lived with my, what I call my spouse for 50 years. We've raised children together. We own a home together. We fight like old married people, but it doesn't matter. If I am not legally married to that person, then that person does not step in and make medical decisions for me unless I name them in a power of attorney. Next under spouse would be my adult children. What if I have more than one? The law says the doctor may go with the majority. So um, here's a really good piece of legal advice for you guys. Have an odd number of children. Um, the problem with having more than one person making a decision and having the same authority is as we talked about before, having two agents. What if they don't agree? So the doctor may go with the majority. And I wanna, that word may, it's small, but it's powerful. So when I name Caitlin as my agent in a power of attorney, the law says the doctor shall accept consent from, from Caitlin. That means the doctor does not have the discretion to say, no, Caitlin's not making good decisions for Dana, okay? Caitlin has the same authority as I do to make decisions for myself when I name her in a power of attorney. When I'm looking at a family member, the word is may. The doctor may listen to the majority and go with the majority rule, which also means he may not, meaning that he goes to court and let the court decide. And that could also be what he does if there's a tie vote. Um, like I said before, I mean, this can tear families apart because they don't agree. I, I've seen this happen in my own extended family. Um, and, you know, Hazel, the person I'm thinking of, died probably close to 20 years ago. And there's one, the two sides of the family still don't speak because they didn't agree um, when she um, was dying. They didn't agree on how to care for her and, and, and whether to let her go or not. So they're still not speaking to each other. So I say all this because this is to protect you and your rights and your decisions, but it's also a protection for your family. Yeah, taking this to court, having the doctor take it to court, it takes up precious time that you may or may not have. Do you really want your family in court if you may be living the last hours of your life? Or do you want them with you by your bedside? Put your wishes in writing. Just make it easy on everybody. Put your wishes in writing. Um, so uh, we're going through the hierarchy again. First, it's my spouse. Um, and yeah, court. Um, who wants to be in court anytime, right? Um, first, it's my spouse. Then it's my adult children. Um, then it goes to my parents. And then after that, my siblings, again, majority rules or may rule. Be careful with that, the majority may rule. Um, and then after siblings, it's uh, any of my blood relatives. So then we're getting into aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews. Um, and then um, after that is something called next friend. I don't know if there's ever been a case in Virginia that has gotten that far down the line. Um, but um, there are a lot of requirements and that, that have to be met for somebody to be called your next friend. Um, so I'm not even gonna get into that. that, that gets into the weeds a little bit. Um, 
Sarah, did you have a question? Did I answer? You had a question, but I can't remember. I think it was something to do with the court. Um, anyway, maybe I, do you see it, Caitlin? Okay, I have five minutes. Um, I'm sorry, Terry, say again. I have a question. Okay. Um, like, you know, I was ill recently and I named, um, a friend as my next of kin contact um, because my advanced directive had already gotten stale. Um, would that have sufficed for decision making if something had happened to me, or would they have gone to my mother, who is my would be my next of kin? Depends on how the the document was worded that you signed, naming your friend um, as your point of contact. Um, you know, did it say on there that that person had the right to make medical decisions for you? I don't remember because I was really sick. <laughs> yeah. So if not, then they would legally have to go to your next of kin. Okay, so I need to pay attention to that or get my advanced directive updated. You and I can do it together because I need to update mine too. Any other questions, comments? Anything. Terry, you keep moving. Okay, Nelson. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, because I'm, I'm just uh, working around and uh, moving around my office in the house, so because I work from home, so I don't have the camera on because I have a mess. That's okay. <laughs> but, you know, I, yeah, you know, thank you for the wonderful presentation. You know, I think that with my wife, we don't have kids for, you know, different reasons. But, uh, you know, I, I always have that conversation with her. Of, you know, if something happened to me, I want you to get the life insurance, make your payments little by little to the house. You know, because the house is almost paid off, you know, but she doesn't have a family. They all passed away. And then in my family I have a few of them but I always concerned because you know everything that I have I have it with her so I I always think that she deserves 100% of everything you know because you know the circumstances that I, I grew up I you know I even met my mom until I was 19 you know my father sent me to study somewhere else you know so I never had that uh, you know relationship with them you know so until like maybe 15 years ago, but I've been married for 18 years and everything. And I always said, I don't think I need to have anything, you know, all the things that we have accomplished because I said, well, you're married and you can make decisions for me. And I always tell her what to do. But now that you brought out that point, you know, I guess let's say if something I felt ill along the way and I get to ICU for, you know, with the uh, oxygen, whatever, and then she calls my family and then my family suddenly show up. And, you know, it looks like then I would have to have like a power and attorney or letter that said that she's the one that has to make the decision. So under the Is law, that, yeah, if you didn't have a document, then yes, your wife would make decisions for you. But what happens if your wife can't do it? Then your family comes forward. So, it, I mean, some people say, well, I don't need one of these because, you know, I, I would choose my wife anyway. So why, why even bother? It's because what happens if your wife can't speak for you either? Um, then that list I went through, could that bring in people that you don't want to be making decisions for you? And if so, then you definitely want to put things in writing. I recommend it regardless. I mean, even if you would choose your wife and, you know, um, she would be the one to make decisions anyway, even if you didn't write it. And you'd also have uh, the chance to put in an alternate. If your wife's not available, then who? Um, would make decisions for you. So I think it's good in all those situations to put these things in writing. Anybody else in the it's last couple minutes? Our, our, okay, I think our time is up. Thank you all very much. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the summit. <laughs>